watching The Producer's Room, a streaming web series featuring the creators behind the hit songs of today's music industry. Songwriters, music producers, and artists discuss their creative process as well as examining current issues and technologies in today's rapidly changing music business. Your host is producer, songwriter, and educator, Dave Tuff. Welcome to The Producer's Room. Six o'clock at night, I have my cup of coffee here, and we're at the Toy Box Studios. I'm going to knock on the door and see if Lidge is here. Yeah! <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> Glad you're here. Come on in. Oh, I'm going to trip over something. <laughs> you win. I will now read your fortune. What's your, what's your fortune? What do you guys want to know? Hey, we'll just go for it. See what he says. Ooh, that's what you need if you're a studio, right? Amen to that. Thanks, Mr. Wizard. So, so as, can you tell us why this is called the Toy Box? I'm just kidding. The Toy Box yeah, Studio. Yeah, so actually there is a reason. So yes. when the studio was first just up in the house, I used to uh, go to the thrift store all the time. And I'd go, you know, spend my, my heart on $2, and I'd buy anything that was a toy that would make music. And I just started collecting. And when I had kids, the kids took all my musical toys, <laughs> but I was left with a few. And so um, when I was making a record with um, the, uh, the Autumn Defense, which is oh. John Sturrett's band of Wilco and Pat Sansone, nice. the, we were making a, a record up in the house, and uh, Pat Sansone came up with the name. He was like, man, you got to call this place the Toy Box. <laughs> That's cool. So, yeah, got, cool. But got named by a famous guy. Not bad. So this is the control room here. This is, uh, if you guys walk in, we've got our, um, over to the left here is our analog world. We've got two inch tape, two track, uh, two track over here, two inch 24 and 16 track right here. And a few cool delays. And, um, you know, analog sounds awesome, so it's nice to have that. And then on the other side of the room, we've got our digital Pro Tools world, and outboard gear. It's nice to have outboard gear to record with and, and uh, get cool sounds. So the space you should be thing I was asking about is the inter sound. What is that? I oh, the inner sound is cool, man. This thing I, I learned about from uh, um, Steve Albini when we were up at Electrical Studios. And you can, it's just like a, it's an analog guitar simulator box. So you just kind of plug your guitar in and you kind of, it's got these, you can distort and crunch and stuff. And in the 90s, we were using it for running our drum loops through. So if you were making a record in the 90s, it was all about having a drum loop for a fill. And then when you got to the fill, you had to filter your drum loop and make it do something cool gotcha. while it was going by. So that's what I was off. And then, you know, we were talking about this. This is the custom-built MCI console. That Jeep Harnett built for Criteria Studios in Miami, where I lived in Studio C all through the 1970s. And this very same console did recorded and mixed Hotel California for the, the Eagles, and it did the Bee Gees Staying Alive and Saturday Night Fever. It did Do You Think I'm Sexy for Rod Stewart, We're an American Band for Grand Funk Railroad, Margaritaville for Jimmy Buffett, and Grease Lightning for. The Grease soundtrack for, uh, did the whole Grease soundtrack for the movie, among many other things. So, very cool record. I think it, it also, Joe Walsh did a record through this. A lot of cool records. It's a great, great rock and roll sound um, with these microphones. One thing I noticed that I find interesting is that you just got NS10s and an R-Tone. So, do you have, what about Yeah, I actually have a subwoofer. So I have oh, okay. A, oh, you got um, Martin and Kriesel subwoofer down there that I, I bought years back when I was looking for a sub, and I took my NS10s to the stereo store where they sold the subs, yeah. and I made them hook them up so I could Match try that. every one until I found one that I liked the best. Very cool. But you'll notice, the thing about the Oratone is you notice there's not two of them. Right. So you key. That's what I was going to ask you. So I just read an article about, was that your article about mixing in mono? It's one article that just popped up. How, how often do you mix in mono? Uh, every single time if I can. Wow. Yeah. Now that I've got the Oratone, which I actually got this year, it makes it really easy. So I can do a mix in stereo. And just at the point of ultimate confusion, you just sum it down, turn the speakers way down low, and listen on the Oratone. 
in mono and it tells you things so clearly that you wow. don't you don't notice in the big speakers. So you can do things like judge your bass uh -huh. level. You know, make uh -huh. sure you're actually hearing your bass on a small speaker. You can judge your vocal level and tell whether you're mixing your vocals way too loud or way too quiet when you're mixing in mono. And then it helps you do things like balance different guitars if you've got parts that are panned out. Um, you know, it just makes it much easier to, to hear. In a lot of rooms that you're working in, you're going to probably have, you know, in a, in a fancy studio it might be symmetrical and everything's sort of perfectly balanced between the speakers. And if you're young and you have perfectly balanced ears too, then maybe you can hear things exactly balanced between left and right. But in the real world, um, as you get older, your, your hearing is different from left and right ears. Uh, your, especially if you play on stage, playing in a rock band for a long time, um, or stand next to the hi-hat and the ride yeah. cymbal of a drum set. But also the room itself, the, the variations between the different speakers and the stuff that's in there will affect your left and right balance. So summing to mono makes it really easy to, to hear how the parts are balancing against each other when you're mixing. That's so the Orton's got a mono input and it's a powered one. Yeah. Um, and it's called the mix cube. And then here, this is a fancy uh, uh, stereo uh, section here, the, cool. the dangerous audio. But I can go to the alt speaker too and then press the mono button. Gotcha. And now it's sending mono out of one of the cables, the left side. So it doesn't matter if you hooked up left or right, or it doesn't matter. It needs to be left. Not if you put some into yeah, mono. Right. Then it's the yeah. same thing. Cool. Or if it isn't. Boy, am I in trouble. <laughs> so you were saying one more time before we leave your analog tape, being a commercial studio, how much time are you spending on that? Just tell us a little bit about the analog. So I have um, some bands that come in and want to use analog. And at this point, it's kind of like vinyl records. It's, mm -hmm. it has, there's, a, there's a hip quality right. to it that people appreciate. And so it tends to be younger bands that, that love the idea of doing analog and they want to do something that's cool sounding and, you know, is recorded in a cool way. Um, and I get some older bands that want to use analog too. Uh, in fact, I did a session for Barry and the Remains. They're a band that opened for the Beatles at Shea Stadium and they came to re-record all their classic Crazy. Um, singles from the 50s and we used the analog and, yeah. and recorded the stuff as closely as we could to their original way. A lot of fun. But the tape sounds killer. I mean, two, uh, yeah. 16 track is my favorite format. It sounds so good. It's just such a pleasure to listen back to the tracks when you record, record on there, especially drums, um, bass, guitars, vocals. Wait, that's everything. <laughs> do, you, do you find performances are different, tracking the analog? I mean, where you can't, they can't mess up, they can't punch in. Bar yeah. Here in a bar there, yeah, so. I think so. I think performances when people feel like they're on the spot and they've got to perform, they perform. Right. It's a remarkable thing. <laughs> it's remarkable that when you have to perform music, you perform music. When you got to do your best job, you start doing your best job. Yeah. I mean, you can probably see that all the time with Hayvale too. But yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, make sure people don't know that you can do a second take. <laughs> so last year. Um, Mike Ferris mixed Shine for All the People with Chad Brown here at the Toy Box studio through the console, and uh, we were able to win a Grammy. So cool. it's actually uh, for, for 2014, but we received it in, in 2015. And um, it won the Best Roots Gospel Album for 2014, I guess, which we received in 2015. <laughs> a little confusing. Uh, but what was cool about it is that we were able to bring the MCI console back to the Grammys because it won two Album of the Year awards in the 70s for uh, Hotel California yeah. and Saturday Night Fever. Sounds like the console's staying alive. Yeah. 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 All right, so <laughs> this is what we call the Door of Rock. Yeah, that's right pretty here. cool. And this is where uh, all the bands come in. Nobody Apparently nobody wanted to crawl down <laughs> on the floor and send about them, but... Uh, I just asked all the bands to sign this when they'd come in, and it's not even everybody, but it's That's cool. a bunch of cool people. Yeah. There you go. This is lick of the day from a Will Kimbrough session. <laughs> he was doing this <laughs> lick of the day, teaching people guitar licks on his yeah, YouTube yeah. channel. Yeah. So come on through here. And we wanted to see the oh, yeah, your, you know your posters in the bathroom. Well, typically, I wouldn't show the bathroom <laughs> off, but I thought you'd like to see the Bonnaroo posters. He's just using that as a <laughs> Yeah, so this is our 12th year going down to Bonnaroo to do the Hay Bale Studio. And uh, here are a few years we've gotten posters 
um, signed by all the bands that come through the studio and do interviews and stuff like that. And it's just it's pretty cool. There's yeah. been a lot of cool bands coming through. Look, Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> He did a hay bale? Yeah, actually, he didn't. He just came through and did an interview, but okay. he ended up on my poster anyway. Nice. It's all about getting the credit, right? <laughs> and, um, yeah, just tons of stuff. There's a few more here. Here's a nice painting by my mom. So you're going to see a lot of artwork there in the studio, but here's one of the posters. And this is a Stephen Keen painting for the Plastic Ono Band. He's a street artist from New York that has painted something like 100,000 paintings or more. Welcome to our tracking space. This is the live room. Uh, I call it the gallery here at the Toy Box Studio. And I'm standing up in the loft, which I call the loft here at the Toy Box Studio. And I'll show you guys around. So this is where we like to do the big loud sounds and do the rock and roll drums and stuff like that. So we're here in the live room. This is where we usually cut. Um, this is if I'm going to cut a full band. And if we've got a drummer, it might be right here on the rug. and. Uh, you know, if we want to get a loud sound, a full sound, one of the cool things is you notice the wall is not super deep this way, so I didn't have a lot of room to work with when I was designing the studio. But um, I took a design from Monty Powell's studio that um, Carl Tatz had designed here in Nashville, and he used the space above the control room as a loft space. So what that does is that you can kind of hear it, like my voice goes up there, bounces back, and throws back out of the loft. So the two mics that are looking over the railing up there are just the permanent room mics. They just always are up there and ready to go at any point. So when we record drums, you get a big room sound that way, and it really, you know, you get a lot of openness out of the drums. And then also the ceiling is 20 feet above your head here, so the snare's got plenty of room to speak going up. And I was telling you this is called the gallery because this wall space here is all my mother was a, a very prolific oil painter and so when she died I filled up a van full of her paintings up in Baltimore and drove it all down here um, to Nashville Tennessee and put it up on the wall so I've got all my mom's artwork and some of uh, actually everything on this wall is my mom's artwork right here um, but one of the cool things that we did is I thought if we're gonna hang oil paintings up on the wall why not just stick 703 behind the wall and have it double as sound treatment for the room? Nice. So that was kind of cool. And then, uh, and then another painting over here. This is um, John Minkoff, who's a guitar player in my band out of St. Louis. And, uh, and then also another of his in the kitchen there. That was actually our album cover. We had an album called Water, Bread, and Beer. And he did the painting for the, uh, for the album cover, and then I bought it from him so I could keep it in the studio permanently. Hmm. That's oh, cool. and then here you go. Check this out. You guys might enjoy this. This is called The Spider Wall of Death. And every time we squash a spider, there we go. <laughs> it gets marked. <laughs> I just personally have a zero tolerance policy that's for in, spiders that's in, the, in studio. the studio space or oh, that's yeah. outside? <laughs> no, that's inside. Um, this is the 1920s Steinway. Seven foot Steinway that used to be. Um, used to be kept by the first jealous of the Boston Symphony Orchestra before I was able to move it down here to Nashville. It's a beautiful sounding piano. It's one of the best pianos in Nashville, actually. Or at least I've been told. So I've been told. And then um, we do, uh, this is actually kind of a cool piece. This is a um, pump organ from the 1800s. And when I got it, it was listed in, in Craigslist. It was actually listed in a Google group. And somebody had posted it saying that they um, had an organ, antique organ, that they wanted to sell or trade for sterling silver. <laughs> and so, and so uh, I went over there and I, I called a buddy of mine. I was like, hey, man. Um, he, I knew he traded silver. And so I found out how much silver was. And I had some, I remembered that when my dad died, I was like, don't I have some old sterling silver, like silverware in China and stuff like that? So I went and looked in the closet. That's my dad right there, actually, when I was 10. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I went, and sure enough, I had old silverware still sort of wrapped up in a bundle. Mm -hmm. So I called my buddy. I found out how much it, it, silver was worth. And I went down to Target, and I bought a little food scale and came home and weighed some. And then I went over to the guy's house, and I was like, well, uh, you know, I got this. You know, how, how's that sound? Do you want to do a trade? And he was like, sure. So I ended up getting this 
antique organ and these beautiful um, fake little Tiffany lamps and this uh, newly upholstered seat to go with it, all for the grand total of four spoons. So I felt pretty good about that. <laughs> and then this over here is the phone booth. I wanted to have a dead room, super dead, so I can record drums in here, record amps, and just get a really uh, tight, tight sound. You know, complete opposite of the other room that you're in. And it's called the phone booth, of course, because you can close the doors and it's great for taking phone calls. You can just hear everything perfectly in here. It's good for meditation, too. It's where you interrogate. And it turns out to be good for recording music. Uh-huh. See, you have your B3, so you must have a B, a Leslie. Yeah, we'll see that upstairs. So here's okay, the cool. Leslie. I, I guess, what is this? This is our 122, I believe, right? I can't remember if it's the 144 or the 122. It sounds great, though. So the Leslie cabinet, if you don't know what a Leslie is, it has a tube amp built into it that the organ plugs into from upstairs. We run a fancy cable down here. And then when it turns on, these speakers have spinning baffles which spin the direction of the speakers. So the low speaker is spinning in one direction and then the high um, cone up here is spinning in another direction. And so you get this, that's how you get the Leslie organ sound that sounds like it's swirling around. And with the box that we've got you can plug in a guitar, you could take vocals from a mix and send it out through the Leslie and re mic it and stuff. So it's really, really cool. I mean, it's, you know, nothing, nothing new under the sun here with this, but if you haven't discovered this yet, you'll be so thrilled the first time you get to use a Leslie pre-recording. It's cool stuff. We're in the lab room again. I thought I'd show you guys some of the mics and stuff like that. Uh, I actually took an old dresser of my dad's, an antique dresser to use as our mic locker, but, you know, we'll have an assortment of dynamic mics for micing up instruments and drums. Um, we've got some cool, funky old ribbon mics, like the old RCA 74 Junior Fatty right there. It's a great sounding mic. Um, and then uh, it just gets, you know, you got uh, mic parts, condensers of various sorts, SM7s, things like that. Some different uh, medium and large diaphragm mics. Um, and that stuff is fun to have around. Uh, and then these guys that are sitting out here, is that an 87 right there? Yeah, right. So this is actually a U67. 67, This wow. was another eBay five years ago, and this came over directly from Germany, actually. Wow. Uh, but it sounds fantastic, and then I had it, um, the, recap, uh, the capsule redone. I actually uh -huh. bought a, a capsule from Bill Bradley cool. at the mic shop out in Franklin, and it has sounded amazing since we got that um, new capsule in there, so... So is that your go-to vocal mic to start out, or is it actually the SM7? No, you know what? I, I, I love that. I use that a lot. It sounds great. Um, I don't really have a go-to vocal mic. Yeah. I just discuss it based on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I love to do a little bit of a shootout with mics if I can, mm -hmm. because you kind of never know right. until you get there. But at the same time, um, I try not to risk losing a great first yeah. moment by making people audition different mics. These mics sound fantastic. This is a local mic company called Mic Tech, um, and I have a lot of mics from them that are really great. This is the CV3. It's a tube mic um, that does multi-pattern, and it just sounds fantastic. I use these all the time as overheads on drums, because they sound really, really good for drums as overheads. Uh, but they sound fantastic on vocals. They have a great mid-range presence to them. Um, and they, they sound wonderful on all kinds of instruments. Great on the piano, too. And I was trying to the, figure out those square-looking things there. They have a You can see the tube. That's cool. Yeah, this is the LeWitt 940. Ah, cool. Um, and these are really, really cool. What they do is they actually, just to make the artists excited, they put a glowing tube right in the window so you can see the tube light up. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not plugged in at the moment. That's but cool. We yeah. got disco lights, right? I'll show you. You know what? I'll plug it in. It's not hard. I got the right one here. That has a, got a lot of pins in it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and then this guy down here. So what's cool about this mic is it allows you to select both a tube circuit and a FET circuit. So ah, check this out. Yeah. This is kind of fun. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for fancy? So when you turn the mic on, 
you can switch over here and you can use all tube for the circuitry or you can come over here and go all FET for the circuitry and then of course you can select your variety of pickup patterns and I tend to like this a lot halfway or or lean it forward what happens is the two mic sounds really warm and wonderful on a vocal especially if you get up close but sometimes you lose a little detail as it all kind of fuzzes out a little bit and so by switching it to the FET it, it sort of brings back the forward yeah. attack of the high frequencies and it just it brings back the transients of the vocal so it's great that's cool um, and then you got low cuts and stuff like that on there too so it's a wonderful mic and um and what's this little box in the toy box? Oh, this <laughs> is that, little guy is down that there? the actual toy box? Yeah, no, this is cool, man. This is just a, uh, what is it, Amplivox guitar amp, a solid state Whoa. guitar amp. Looks like a little Suitcase. cheap TV, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and of course, you've got three inputs, because who wouldn't need three Dude, inputs for this awesome. little amp right here? Tone and volume. It's great to have little amps like that around. Um, and, and it's good to have little amps that you may or may not use in a session, but have them in the control room. Yeah. So that you can easily plug a bass, a guitar, mm -hmm. anything into something and, and demonstrate ideas when you're producing with the band. You just oh. want to be able to quickly, you know, listen to sounds, work out melodies. Cool. Whatever. Yeah. Go upstairs. Uh, welcome to the loft here at the Toy Box. Uh, these are just some of our random things over here, fun items. You got, you know, got to have the uh, 3D virtual Game Boy. Um, this is a really cool thing called the Stylophone, which is, uh, this is like, uh, I think they use this on Space Oddity. Not this one, but the same instrument. And you actually use these cool pens. They make miniature ones now that you can get, but you just touch it here on, the, on this and it, and it plays cool synth sounds. And then we've got um, reel-to-reel -reel tape machines, old mono tube reel-to-reel -reel down here, great old uh, um, Califone cassette deck, just some cool funky toy synths, um, and then, you know, scads of guitar pedals. That's one of the most fun things is to be able to just do guitar overdub day and just like lay out all the pedals on the floor and start, start uh, playing with knobs and, and dialing in guitar sounds. And then this up here doubles as the lounge, but it's also, you know, I try to keep it set up with the, the old Sure Vocal Master for doing band rehearsing or songwriting, or if I'm just going to, you know, play music with an artist or, or have a jam session, try and keep it always set up so it's really easy to come up here and play. So is guitar still your main instrument or drums or all yeah, the above? Yeah, guitar's my main instrument. I like playing drums a lot, but, you know, unless I'm practicing. <laughs> You know, yeah. uh, it might be tough on whoever else is playing with me, you know what I mean? <laughs> so then um, I keep the organs and keyboards up here too. This is a really cool Lowry Symphonic Holiday. It just does uh, a lot of solid state synth sounds. And um, this is like your, your indie rock secret weapon. So wow. if you want to make something sound like an indie rock band, just do an overdub with that and you'll be, <laughs> you'll be right on target. And then this is the uh, Hammond M101. Uh, it's a... Uh, tube Hammond organ and we'll run this through the Leslie combo pedal downstairs to the Leslie so that's how you can get the uh, you know like a classic Hammond organ sound the rolling string machine hanging out but this is the uh, piece de resistance right here so let me show you guys this this is called an Optagon and if you've ever seen a Mellotron and know what that is uh oh so if you know what a Mellotron is, a Mellotron uses tape loops, you know, to, uh, to play back the, the recorded loops. The Optagon uses optical soundtrack to play back the recorded loops. And this whole thing is made out of wood and cheap plastic. It you know, feels like it's made by Mattel or something like that. But you pop this guy in here, fire it up.
all sounds like Scooby Doo music right here. Right, anyway, so that's it. each disc have a, a different sound to yeah, it? Yeah, so there's a whole collection of discs. And uh, one of my favorite ones right here is uh, Rock and Rhythm. Ah. I just like the cover. <laughs> looks like Greatest American <laughs> Hero. <It does. laughs> Flash Gordon or something. Yeah, exactly. Flash Gordon. Nice, man. So, you know. Gotta have some toys up here. In the toy box. So the drummer, the cues for the drummer are... Well, usually the drums are downstairs that oh, we're recording. Okay. This is These more for rehearsal. rehearsal. Okay. But uh, I can show you the cue system downstairs. Yeah, let's, let's see it. It's nothing out. fancy, but it's yeah, uh, it functions, which is the important part. You know, have something that works well that is probably a lot like what everybody else might have. Mm. Uh, wait, what were we gonna do? Cue green, do cue system. Oh, yeah, cue system. system. So I'll show you guys something here. So this is this is what we're using right now, which is the it's actually a Behringer unit, but it's a four-way cue system. Nothing too fancy, but what we've done is we've, we've hooked it up in, I think, a, a rather clever way, which is you have four different headphone mixes going on here, four different headphone outputs, and then sort of a master input. And what, uh, what we did is I'll send my mix that I'm doing in the control room directly out through the cues, and it just comes to this box, and, and every single pair of headphones gets the same mix. It's the same thing I'm listening to. But I had a custom cable built. So what this box does that's kind of cool is it has an auxiliary input. Yeah. So you can add an additional input on the front here. And then um, you can blend it in with the mix. So this way we can start out. Let's see which one is which here. I think we start out with my mix there. And then as we turn it this way, it starts blending in whatever's coming in on this cable. Oh. So typically on a session... My first one will be for the drummer, and I'll be feeding automatically feeding click on this maxed out, really loud, louder than anybody yeah. else is going to want it. And then they can blend it in and make sure that they get a really loud, solid click in their headphones. And I'll give the drummer a pair of isolating headphones uh -huh. so that the click doesn't bleed out into the overhead mics because that's not really what you want. And then the bass would be on here, and same story, the bass would have the direct bass track coming in on here so that, again, a bass player might have trouble really hearing the low end in their bass part unless it's really a lot of bass in the mix because mm -hmm. they may have to turn their headphones up. Plus, you got to remember to give the bass player a pair of headphones that actually has low end to them. That's <laughs> key. And then the guitar players might be here. You know, same yeah. thing. We'll just put, put each guitar into here. And then I just had a custom cable built to make it really easy to hook this thing up. And the other end of this cable comes down here. And a stereo mix comes out of the panel. Uh -huh. Four more me mixes come yeah. down here, and then the power cable is included too, so that cool. you can just easily pick this whole thing up and just kind of move it around the room where you need it to be. And you can always tweak your mix too to provide further, like if it, you're doing guitar overdubs or something, right? So yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll change my mix yeah. as needed. But a lot of times when you're working, you're trying really hard to just get your own mix right. You yeah, know, know yeah. that you're making something sound great. And so you really want to make it sound right for you in the control room so you can feel confident uh -huh. about what you're recording. And when people start asking you for all kinds of variations, yep. I usually just tell them to be patient. <laughs> right. <laughs> tell them I'm going to get, you know, wait till we get the mix balanced, wait till everything's sounding right, and then we'll go in and address your additional needs, you know, what you need. We'll make sure you've got it. So one other question before we leave this room, uh, as far as when you were building this, what acoustic considerations, like, I mean, as far as the wall, I mean, if someone's starting with a garage, because I think it's pretty fascinating that you did all this yourself. Like How do you a wall design within the a walls? wall? And, yeah, you want to see what the inside of the wall looks like? Yeah, yeah. So um, the important thing when you're designing is to know the difference between uh, sound transmission and sound reflection. So those are different kinds of treatments for your room. Sound transmission means the sound is being transmitted from one space through something into the other. So by building thick walls and leaving an airspace in between them, that's how you prevent sound transmission going from the control room through the walls into, or excuse me, the live room through the walls into the control room. Because when I built this place, for example, I knew I was like, I'd, I'd done enough sessions in yeah. home basement studios where 
you know, you can't really hear what's coming out of the speakers because it's still coming out of the kick drum or the guitar so loud. So I really wanted to have isolation and be able to hear a kick drum and know what it was. So when we built this, we actually left this little door in here so we could get through there and route more cables and things like that. But you see, what you see there is the back side of the wall of a control room where it's uh, on the other side. In the control room, you see the, the uh, um, drywall. And yeah. then on this side, you just see the framework and the insulation. And then it's just open space. So is it cinder block on both sides then, or is it... There's no cinder block in okay. there. That's just, that's just see fr regular old frame construction. Wow. The cinder blocks are on the outside of the building. It's mainly just the airspace that you're looking for. Yeah, the yeah. airspace and a, and a thick enough wall that the okay. sound is stopping and it's not getting transmitted too much. Crazy. And then also the insulation. If you had that same airspace and you didn't have the insulation in there, it would be, you know, not nearly as effective. Wow, wow. Anything else yeah. we should hit here? Uh, we hit know. it all. You know, We've hit about everything. Air conditioners. Yeah. That's something that nobody wants to think about when they're building studios. This, by using mini split air conditioners, it allowed me to build the rooms and the sound isolation the way I wanted and then add the air conditioning. So that does AC and heat. Yeah. And I could do it as an afterthought because I only have to drill a small hole through the wall and mount it. But they are rather expensive. And they are rather prone to breaking a lot. Hmm. So, yeah, one so thing you is, have like three, of, two or three of them, right? You have one. In your yeah, I got, you got to put one in every room. That's oh, a yeah. thing, you know. Oh. Even the little phone booth has got its own, oh, just wow. because otherwise you can't put a drummer in there to play. Yeah. And so, um, if you're gonna build a studio and do your home studio, just be prepared to spend your money instead of spending it on recording gear. Get prepared to spend it on air conditioning units. Because that's going to be your big ex biggest expense for a while, I think. All right. Well, I guess we should wrap it. I kind of feel sad. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> Just hugs? Yes, hugs. hugs. <laughs> How can people find you in all your various ventures? So I'm easy to find. You can just go to thetoyboxstudio.com. And you'll find the studio there. You can go to recordingstudiorockstars.com. And that will take you to, to my podcast. Um, if your fingers are tired and you don't want to type all that in, you can just type rsrockstars.com, and it's a little bit easier. Cool. And um, if you want to learn more about the Hay Bale Studio, go to thehaybalestudio.com. And if you want to learn more about Stereo Sessions, you can go to stereosessions.com. So, wow. Wow. pretty simple and straightforward. And we can search you on YouTube, right, too, for and you some can, of that? Yeah, you can find me on YouTube under Recording Studio Rockstars or Stereo Sessions nice. or the Toy Box Studio TV. Awesome. You're well represented. Yeah, <laughs> probably too well represented at this point. Well, thanks, Lynch, for yeah. having us, man. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, man. We'll see you guys pleasure. next time on The Producer's Room.